I am uh, Jonathan Holmes. I am Quixel's community manager. It's uh, great to have you guys here. Um, for those of you who were around last time for the uh, intro to Megascan Studio, I uh, will gladly reintroduce Linus. Hi. He is a prominent and quite uh, auspicious community staffer. Great guy to work with. Uh, I also want to introduce Owen. He is one of our in-house artists. He actually made most of the assets I'm going to be demonstrating here today. So, hey, good to see you all. Now, we, uh, we're going to try to do this pretty quickly. Uh, we have about an hour to an hour and a half to kind of go over all of this stuff that we're going to try to cover. Um, I've been doing furious prep work trying to get this scene like wrapped up and ready. I, I have to have this thing done by December, so I've had Owen and Linus kind of walking me through some of the aspects of this, because I am by no means an Unreal Master, but I know my way around it well enough to make some relatively interesting looking stuff. So um, what we're going to try to do is demonstrate how to take Unreal Assets, or sorry, yeah, yeah, Unreal Assets, essentially, and bring them in for Megascans to make them look as pretty much as good as we can possibly do it in real time. And um, you'll see some glaring issues so far. Um, <clears throat> like, for example, the, the grass texture from Megascans does not match the quality of the grass that I made from a Megascans library. And specifically, the reason for that would be that there is no AO on this. So we're going to go over to how to combine some of that stuff inside of the editor itself. Um, you can see the difference visually between Megascan rocks on the right here, which with displacement and a lot of the fun stuff, next to Megascans textures that have no nothing done to them, essentially. Um, the visual difference between having AO baked into a texture in this engine and not having it in there, at least for the terrain, is like a humongous difference. It's just mind-blowingly different. You can, I think you can see the results side by side here. Um, so while we go over a lot of this, I'm going to do my best to pay attention to chat. Um, but I will more than likely get wrapped up in what I'm working on. So Linus will be handling chat moderation. So um, if you guys have any questions or anything you'd like to see, any concerns, comments, um, this is being obviously streamed live and it's going to be uploaded to my YouTube account uh, that Quixel provided for us. So if you did miss this and you're watching this later on, um, good to have you on board as well. I will cover as much as I can, and I'm sorry if you guys are watching later because obviously you won't be able to ask any questions, but that's all right. So um, starting now, um, what we kind of went over before was making essentially a, a master material. And if we go into my content browser here, you can see the essentially the the core of my project, which is just a bunch of folders with assets added into them. And, and none of, none of this is really like. Um, anything too complex. It's, it can seem daunting if you've never done it before, um, but really all we're trying to do is set up our project so that it's easy to add and drag and drop textures directly into a, a material that will serve as a container for instancing later on. Um, so if we go to my foliage tab here for my materials, you'll see that I have a basic foliage master here. And this looks slightly complex, but it's really not. Uh, I've kind of finagled all these values to doing what I want them to do. Uh, it may not be the 100% accurate Epic Games wants you to do it this particular way, realism, but I think it looks good for me. And I think the grass and the um, the ferns themselves look you know, pretty good for a real-time sim. So um, I'll show you how I built all this. Really, it's, it's nothing more than the fuzzy shading grass mixed in with a bunch of parameters, which essentially just hold down one convert to parameter, give it a name, um, and then you can just wire that up into any of this. It's super simple. And then when you have a parameter in the material editor, you can actually transfer that to an instance and change that on the fly at any point in time. So for example, with this foliage master, I've got two different instances of it, like the grass and the ferns, and these are actually controlling the look of everything in this scene through the, uh, the foliage tool. So if I wanted to change the subsurface scattering of these um, of these ferns and these grasses, it really doesn't take much more than um, whoops than essentially uh, playing with a couple of values. So like for example, the the normal strength, which really makes these things pop, um, which is one of the things you were playing with before uh, the stream started, was to jack up the green and red channels so that these ferns stop looking so flat. Because right out of the Mega Scans library this is what you get, and 
I think you guys can agree that this looks significantly... It doesn't look bad, but I think it could look a lot better. And Owen himself mentioned that, and um, maybe you want to cover some of that for us so we can... Um, like, I, I'll just yeah, play sure. some values if you want to talk. Yeah, um, so basically, the normals that you get for the foliage, uh, it depends per asset, but for a lot of the leafy foliage that you download from the site, normals can be fine when you import them, but it's good to be able to boost the strength if you need to, to kind of emphasize the details, because for up-close shots, that's fine, it'll look great, but if you're at a glance, like, if you're, for example, in a third-person game and you're walking through a forest, there's going to be a load of foliage on the ground, and you want those details to pop out a bit more than they might accurately do. So to do that, you can obviously boost the normal strength of uh, the texture, which will allow you to just get a much much like more defined look from, from distance, which really helps to pop out the details and actually helps remove the flatness from the leaves as well. So you get a much more defined look overall. So um, it's really worth playing with this, even on the surfaces as well, to kind of get more of a, a kind of exaggerated lighting effect. But it's also worth cautioning as well, because if you go too far with this, you can obviously mess up the entire um, material. So it's good to just have the ability to play around and, and find values that work. Um, so it's always about the end result. Like you said earlier, like there's no really right or wrong way to go about making anything. It's all about finding uh, something that looks good in the end. So um, having the power to make a shader where you can just use parameters to, to tweak things is, is the way to go for sure. Yeah, and I, I really like the, um, the flexibility of Unreal Engine. Uh, I've always used it for the past 10 years or so. It's been my go-to engine for pretty much everything that I do, um, mostly because I'm a visual person and I like to be able to play with something and see the end result in real time rather than trying to guess to figure out what these numerical values are doing. So to me it's less about the numbers, like 3 doesn't mean anything to me in this context, but the visual result does. And um, I think that's where some of the disconnect comes with people when they see people playing with numbers, like how did you come to 3 for red, 3 for green, and 0.75 for blue, and it, well to me it just looks good. It's just the same thing as like why did you use overlay and vivid light and Photoshop for particular layers. It just looked good. There's no, I mean, there's mathematical reasons behind it. If you're more of a technical artist, you'll understand the reasoning. But for me, as an artist and not much of a mathematics person, the visual aspect and being able to see what I'm doing in real time is what makes this engine for me. Um, and as Owen said, the uh, you can easily take this instance that I've got and push it way too far. So like, if I wanted to make this like a level of 90 on the red and green channels, like this looks horrible. Well, maybe not too horrible, but it doesn't match the rest of the the environment, so the normal strength is completely wrong. But just a little bit of boosting still keeps the, the value of light hitting it and still allows you to change pretty much anything you want about it. And the nice thing about this too is that sometimes you'll find that the, the scanned values, while physically accurate, aren't always corresponding to what looks best in a video game. Um, and even this may be a little too shiny. And what, what I'm trying to do with this environment, for those of you who came back from the, uh, the Megascan Studio introduction a couple of weeks ago, this is supposed to be, well, the end result is going to be this train rolling through um, the Florida countryside. And there's ferns here, there's uh, dirt, grass, leaves, pine trees, mostly pine trees. They're everywhere. And it's kind of wet and moist here. It's a tropical environment. Um, some of these things will have wetness, but in the middle of the day, I mean, the sun here is like just blazing hot. So most of that stuff, unless it's in deep cover like this, tends to be kind of dry. So you don't really want to have terribly reflective fern surfaces or plant surfaces, unless it's like closer to a shadowed area. Um, which of course you could probably do that with another instance and just paint you know, a foliage and uh, like if you actually use the foliage tool, for example, if I was to bring that up in here and then I was to have another instance of this particular fern and then load that up with its own wet, moist texture, I can then throw that in here anywhere I want it to and kind of put it in like more occluded areas where it might actually add some more visual interest to the scene. But for what we're doing, it's like most of this isn't going to be like that. So the default mega scans roughness is too much, which is right here which this looks awesome, like if this was the Pacific Northwest, like Seattle or um, Oregon, for example, or anything up in, in the Northwest of the United States, this is what it looks like. But here in Florida, it's a little dry, and especially with the sun hitting it the way it does, unless it rains, which it does every summer, so then it would look more like it did with the default roughness. But we're just assuming it's a nice dry day. 
Um, Actually, I have something to say there as well. Um, as well, these assets are scanned in a, in a specific biome in the world, but that doesn't mean you can alter the values yourself to suit a more uh, a completely different place like you're doing right here. So there's always the power to use the values you get and be able to tweak them to, exactly. to match your particular scene. And we encourage you to do that because you're kind of you're making your own your own version of of the uh, using the scans as a base. You can make your own cool, unique results. That's something we definitely think is a good thing. Yeah, and pretty much the, the entire Megascans library as it currently stands is mostly Nordic stuff. So it's mostly stuff built from, let's say, like Sweden, Norway, Denmark. It's not anything that's anywhere close to where you would see things in, in Florida here. And um, like it's, it's nice to be able to take any of this stuff into the studio program that we have for Megascans, quickly adjust something to your liking, and then when you're done, you kick it out to Unreal and you blend it together and you end up with a completely different result from whatever biome it originally came from. And you're not really limited to any particular environment. The only real limit is your imagination. Because um, you can make pretty much anything you want. And that's the most um, the most fascinating part about working with Studio and working with Megascans is that I've heard in the past people would say, well, if, if everybody has access to the same materials then isn't everything going to look the same? And I would say to that, well, no, because everybody has access to reality and everybody has a camera, but that doesn't mean everybody's a photographer. And that doesn't mean all the photographs are going to look exactly the same. There's, there's a humongous difference in artistic style between one photographer to another. And if game art is moving to a point where it becomes more about composition, lighting, and other forms of non-technical artistry, really all it's doing is going back to the, the basics of art, which again, if you don't have the artistic skills necessary to, to make something look good, then it's not going to look as good as someone who does. And um, really, it, it then just it becomes more of a core skill rather than do I know this particular engine inside and out, more do I know the basics of art inside and out? Do I know what makes form, light, color, value? Do I know what makes all of this combine into something that people will enjoy? Yeah, like the, the end result, the product that you're making isn't going to be just solely on the scans. The scans are tools used to help you actually build something cool. Like, literally, they're, they're, they're part of the building blocks to make interesting scenes, interesting, like, worlds that you have to make. So, obviously, like, the the more you have a plan and the more you, you know what you're doing, the more you can use the tools to help you achieve your vision. It's not about, like grabbing the sample assets and putting them into a far scene, you know, like there's a lot, so much more you can do with these things. And yeah, like it's, it, the, the uh, possibilities are just infinite, literally like this crazy amount. Now, uh, I saw one of the comments uh, where Linus kind of, or not exaggerated, but sorry, uh, explained that yes, the, uh, the atlases are basically flat images and they are applied to flat planes. But you can see in this particular instance here, the, um, the foliage that I'm using, this is something that Owen himself made. So if I increase the size of this a little bit, and it'd be nice if the content browser made these, uh, if there's a way to change the light in here. Do, do you know of a way to do that off the top of your head? I've never uh, really thought about it. In Portrait Theme, there's a, there's a new nice showcase, but unfortunately in this version there isn't. No, well, I probably should have updated then, shouldn't I? But that's okay. So right now, I mean, if you look at the way this is built, um, if we show the, I believe it's the, it should be a wireframe, there it is. It really is nothing more than, um, you know, just a set of polygons like anything else is. And these are mostly flat planes that have been curved um, with a double-sided uh, material applied to them and a little bit of a, a tube running through the, the center of them to give them a stem. It's really not much more than that. And what really makes these is the scanned data that, that they're pulling from. So if I was to come in here and for example, we'll move that out of the way and just put this here by itself and then zoom around it. Let's close this out. You can see how it's constructed and how it works. And the atlases that we have on megascans.se are really just kind of like the, the basic building blocks to get to this point where you can take anything that you've essentially seen on the site and then kind of reverse engineer it into an actual piece of geometry that, that looks like something from reality. And uh, Owen, could you want to go over the, the, the building process for this? Yeah. Uh, I actually see a question there on the chat that, that asked about the atlases and, and if they are just flat uh, textures. So yeah, they are, they are just flat images, but 
they're intended so that you can then create geometry over the uh, the various leaves and then build your own plants just like this one here and, and actually make it into an object. So the reason that they're presented in a flat plane and instead of an actual asset is uh, so that you have the maximum control to make just any kind of plants you want. Although 3D assets are on their way and they will be in future waves. Um, but yeah, so creating these assets, uh, I personally use GrowFX, uh, which is a third-party uh, plugin for 3ds Max, but they work perfectly well with Speedtree or pretty much anything. You can even just make your own Amaya using planes. So uh, it's such a simple setup depending on how detailed you want to be, but really just putting some square planes over, or you can even model roughly over the shape of each leaf and then export them out and uh, use them with the correct uh, pivot point at the stem of the leaf. And then you can attach them to various branches in Speedtree. Like, um, I'm sure we'll put up a guide soon on, on creating these, but uh, it's it's very cool the amount of um, variation you can get out of just a, one simple atlas. You can just use it for scatter leaves in the ground, use it for trees, use it for uh, small bushes, and have them all running off one atlas. So it's pretty cool. Now it's not just atlases that you can do this with as well. Like like I said earlier, these rocks, uh, the ballast, is what this is actually called in, in railroad parlance. Um, the ballast itself is just a simple rock scan for mega scans that I see, and I'll actually go to the site and show it to you. Uh, sorry to interrupt, guys. I think we're going to have to restart the stream real quick. We need to change some bitrate settings. The uh, actual stream quality coming out right now looks horrible. Really? Yes, it looks terrible. It needs to be fixed. Uh, so we just need to restart real quick. We'll be right back, guys. Okay, one second. <laughs> 